Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the Sunday worship service. And I pray that today the word of the Lord will be real in every heart, in your heart in particular. And what the Lord wants to accomplish by the word is sent. The Lord will accomplish in your life, in my life, in our lives together. In Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we give glory to your name, honor to your name, blessing to your name. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all the sacrifices you made when you are here on earth and the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary to produce, to raise up a church pure, righteous, holy, and rapturable. We well, thank you because you've made us part of that church, expecting your coming. And Lord, we want to do everything there is to do by your enablement to be ready for that rapture and your coming in Jesus' name. We're asking that today, Lord, you speak to every heart. Open the pages of scriptures to everyone. Make it clear, make it plain, that he that readeth, he that heareth, may run. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Today we're coming to the letter, the message, the epistle, that Jesus Christ, the head of the church, sent from heaven. And he sent it first to the church in Tatira. But you understand, like the message of the epistle to the Romans, initially to the Romans, but now for the whole church, like the epistle to the Ephesians, reaching to the Ephesians to start with, but now it's for the whole church. And this message that Christ has sent through John the Beloved and he sent it to the church in Tatira. At the end, he says, it's not only for this church, it's for all the churches in all the generations from that time until he will come. That's why he ends every letter, every message, every epistle, everything coming from him, Christ, to the church, to each of the churches. And he said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And so the same word is sending to us today. I need to tell you that this church in Tatira, they had gone into pollution, into defilement, as well as into corruption. And the Lord was concerned, and he sent the message to them, that is, to that church. You know, when the Lord sends you with a message, you must catch not just the message superficially. You must understand the heart with which he sent the message. The concern with which he sent the message. If he sent a message smiling, you cannot deliver the message frowning. If he sent a message with concern, if he sent a message frowning at the people, having controversy with the people, you cannot bring the message to the church in Tatira or to the church in deeper line with a smile if he sent it with a concern and he sent it with a frown and it's the same thing you are going to find in this epistle in this message to the church of Tyre. let's look at it in Revelation chapter 2 verse 18 and unto the angel of the church in Tatira write these things says the son of God who has his ears like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. In verse 19 it says, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, 
and thy patience and thy works, and the last will be more than the first. But now it's going to come to an area of concern that he had for that church in verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. In verse 21 it says, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Then verse 22 says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except the repent of their deeds. In verse 23, it says, And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now, in verse 24, it brings the command, it brings the counsel, it brings uh, the directives as to what the minister of that church and what all the members of that church ought to do so that they will escape the fury, the wrath, the indignation, the damnation that will come upon the people that are corrupted. It says in verse 24, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Tatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Then in verse 25, he says, But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Verse 26 says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And he says, and I will give him the morning star. Verse 29, in conclusion, he says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. That's the message we're looking at coming from Christ. The message today is titled, Preserving the Purified Church from Pollution. Preserving the saved, sanctified, gracious, spotless church from pollution. Preserving the body of Christ, preserving the rapturable church from corruption and pollution. Preserving the Christian, preserving you in particular from corruption, from pollution, and from defilement. As we look at the message, we're going to see three different sections in the message. Number one, the peculiarities of Christ. He introduced himself. And as he introduced himself, you will find he has the final authority, absolute authority, and all judgment has been committed into his hands. The peculiarities of Christ. And now as he talks to the church point number two, the perverseness of corruptors. It talks about Jezebel. It talks about those committing fornication, adultery with Jezebel. And it talks about the people who have been influenced by Jezebel. He mentioned her by name. Of course, you understand Christ, the final authority and the perfect judge will not be afraid of Jezebel, 
If the local pastor there, the angel, the minister, the leader of the church in Tatira, if he was afraid of Jezebel, of course, you know, our Lord, the Son of God, the sword of God, the such light of God, and the final judge will not be afraid of Jezebel. And so the Lord brought the message direct. And he says, there is a corrupter there, there are corruptors there, the perverseness of corruptors. Point number three is the promise for conquerors. This will conquer, and they conquer all the defilement coming from the company of people that were there purposefully to corrupt the church, they overcame. And because they overcame, and he wants them to keep on overcoming, he now gives a promise that has many parts unto them. The promise for conquerors. We're coming to point number one. In point number one, we're looking at the peculiarities of Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Tatira, write, This six says the Son of God. It says he is the Son of God. He is the foundation of the church. He is the cornerstone of the church. He is the final judge in the church. And he introduces himself and says, the Son of God is talking to you, pastor, preacher, minister, leader of the church in Tatira. And the same thing he's saying to you is introducing himself as the foundation of the flock. Look at Matthew chapter 16, looking at verse 16. Matthew chapter 16 Verse 16, and Simon answered and said, Thou art the Christ, who is that? The Son of the living God. And then in verse 17, the Lord said, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed each unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And now he reveals the foundation of the church as for the first time he's mentioning the church. And he says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, upon this foundation, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Thank God that the first time he mentioned the church, he said, the gates of hell, the powers of darkness, and the powers that be will try to fight against that church, crush that church, corrupt that church, pollute that church. But he said, the gates of hell, with all the defilement, with all their pollution and with all their corruption will not succeed in prevailing to corrupt, to crush, to destroy the church. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, talking about the church, it says, for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid. Christ has laid the foundation, and he is the foundation, the foundation of the church, the foundation of the flock, and he says that foundation is Christ. Now, as so you come back to Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 18, the Lord continues to introduce himself, and he says, and unto the angel of the church in Tatira, write, this six says the Son of God, look at this, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire. Who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire. I told you earlier that when Christ has sent a message with concern 
and then his eyes are like a flame of fire. It's not like a smiling Christ now. It's not like an inviting, attractive Christ now. His eyes like a flame of fire. You know, sometimes some people will say, his eyes, they terrify me. And I wish that he would not, you know, make his eyes or his face to be like that. Well, look at the Son of God whose eyes were like a flame of fire. Look at that introduction in chapter 1. Chapter 1, looking at verse 14. In chapter 1, verse 14 of Revelation, his head and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow. Look at this now. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. As John looked at him, and he saw flames of fire coming out of their eyes, the fire that will destroy and devour and consume the unbelievers if they die in unbelief. It tells us Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 11. Still talking about Christ, it says in verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful, capital A, it's talking about Christ, and True, capital T. And in righteousness, the see judge and make war. He will be coming again. And when he comes again, he'll come with eyes like a flame of fire. He'll come with fury. He'll come with indignation. He'll come with wrath. He'll come with judgment to judge the sinners who remain adamant in sin and they keep on living in sin until the coming of Christ. He comes for fury, for fire, as a flame of fire. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 2 in verse 18. He's still introducing himself and unto the angel of the church in Tatira write, This thing says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire. And his feet are like fine brass. He had actually said that in chapter 1. Come to chapter 1 of Revelation. And in verse 15, he talks about his feet. And his feet are like unto fine brass. Look at this. As if they burnt in the furnace. The feet from the furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. It tells us in chapter 19 of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19, looking at verse 15. Here it tells us about this Christ, and it tells us about the symbolism and the emblem of the feet like brass. It says, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it it should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth. There's a significance, there's a symbolism of the feet of brass, as if they were born in the furnace. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. In verse 16, he tells us who he is. He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name reaching King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're coming back to Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, after the Lord introduced himself as the Son of God, as the one that has eyes like a flame of fire, 
I like the one that has feet as if they were brass burnt in the furnace. Now in verse 19, Revelation chapter 2, verse 19, I know thy works is not going to tell the church, the minister, the members, the leaders, and the followers in that church is going to tell them some things they thought were secrets, some things they thought it will not go beyond our little confinement here. They didn't know that heaven knew everything. He covers scandal on earth. It's an open revelation from heaven. And Christ is now going to give the facts about the church. And the facts are faultless. The facts are perfect. The facts are true. The faultlessness in his facts. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and patience and thy works. He mentions the works again, the activities again, the spiritual duties again, and their deeds again. And then he says, and the last to be more than the first. Well, say, so far, so good. If this were the end of the message to the church in Tatira, that would have been wonderful. When Christ says, I know thy works. I know your activities. I know your up and doing. I know your fervency. And I know the drive in your life. And I know the purposeful plan and project you carry on. And I know them in the plural. Not only that, as it comes to the end of the verse, and it says, I know thy works again. It says, and the last to be more than the first. That's what every one of us should pray to have. So that our last works will be greater or be higher, or be purer, or be farther than the false works. That is so that our work in the Lord, our earnestness in the Lord, our passion in evangelism, our passion in doing the work of the Lord inside the church and outside the church for edification in the church, and for evangelization in the world. That what we do now in the last days, what we do now at the latter time, what we do now as we're getting older is greater than what we did when we first knew the Lord and the Lord began to itemize what this minister did. And of course, the faithful, profitable members of that church walking along with the minister. He says, I know your charity, your charity, which is very important, your love, which is very important, but we hope that charity will be the love of God coming from the heart, agape love, not just superficial human love. I know your charity. I know your service. Service within the church, service outside the church, ministering to the neighbors, being a good Samaritan, and being a good servant of God in the church. I know your service, serving the poor, serving the naked, serving the illiterates, serving the semi-illiterates, serving the educated, serving the young, Serving with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Serving to be your benefit to everyone that comes around you. And if they don't come, you get to them. And I know your faith. Your faith, when there's any problem, any challenge, any sickness, any infirmity, that you have this faith in the Lord and you will not allow unbelief to take over your heart, take over your mind, or take over your life. And then he says, I know your patience. 
This man was patient. This minister was patient. And the Lord commended that patience. And now we need to be patient. Look at your life. Let me look at my life. Let's look at ourselves. Number one, personally, with yourself. You have a goal. You have a, a drive. You have a destination. Are you patiently running the race to get there? Or are you so much in a hurry? You don't want to plant before you reap. I know your patience. After planting, you know, we keep on watering patiently until we reap. Your patience in your family. Your patience with members of your family. Sometimes you expect in your family that maybe your spouse, your husband, your wife will be up there and lift you up higher and higher. But it's not exactly like you thought. Are you patient? You get angry. You flare up. You throw things around. And you are nervous. And your nerves, you wear them on your sleeves. And your temper flares up. Patient people don't do that. You are patient. It says, I know thy patience. You also are patient if there is a problem. There's a challenge. Nobody likes problem. Nobody likes pain. But while the problem is there, while the pain is there, while the persecution is there, he says, I know your patience. That's what the Lord wants us to bring on board in our lives. He wants us to develop that patience that is given by the Spirit of God. Actually, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And then he says, I know your patience with people. We must be patient with people. You cannot live life all alone by yourself. If you were the only tree in the forest, you will not enjoy the loneliness. You need that other person, that other person. They may not walk tall like you want them to walk tall. They may not walk fast like you want them to walk fast. They may not have the attitude and the disposition you want them to have. The time you want them to have that. I know your patience with yourself. I know your patience with members of your family. I know your patience with problems. I know your patience with pain. I know your patience with persecution. I know your patience with people around you. It says, and I know thy works. And the last to be more than the first. That's the commendation. And the facts he gave were faultless. But now it's going to tell them what they needed to look into so that they are not carried away with our works, our charity, our service, our faith, our patience, our works, and the last, there'll be more than the first. It says, don't be carried away with that. There are some very serious matters in that church that needed correction. That brings us now to point number two, the perverseness of corruptors. The perverseness of corruptors. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Hold on. If somebody who is not a member of the church, who doesn't know about salvation, who doesn't know about the standard of the word of God, if he comes, he says, hold on, hold on, wait. I wanted to tell you, I have something against you. You look at him and say, who are you? It's just a sinner, a man of the world. Whatever he has against you, you brush all that aside. If somebody is ignorant, ignorant about the standard of the word of God, ignorant about your life, ignorant about what drives you, what propels you, if somebody is ignorant comes to you and says, hey, I've been wanting to talk to you. I have somewhat against you. You see, that's all right. I know you have something against me because you are ignorant of my action, my attitude, 
the propelling power and factor in my life. You have something against me, go and pray about that. Don't even bother to tell me. But this is Christ. This is the head of the church. This is the Savior. And this is the one appointed by the Father that it will be the final judge. He will judge everyone according to their works on the final day. He is the one that is saying authoritatively, notwithstanding all your service, notwithstanding all your works, notwithstanding all your charity, notwithstanding all your patience and perseverance, notwithstanding all your faith, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, which calleth herself a prophetess. Her name is not even in the book of life. Heaven does not know her. The Father does not affirm her. Christ does not confirm her authority. She was a self-imposed person on that church. She calls herself a prophetess. And her work, what she was doing in that church, was to teach and to seduce, to instruct and to entice, to admonish and to draw people into evil, to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Verse 21, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Fornication became her badge. Fornication became her identity. Fornication became her title. And she held on to that as a personal property, personal characteristic, her fornication. I gave her a chance to repent, and she repented not. The Lord now said in verse 22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed that's a bed of punishment, a bed of suffering, a bed of torment, a bed of plague, and a bed of the recompense of what she was doing. I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her. Them that commit adultery with her. Hold on. This one is worse than the Jezebel of the Old Testament. The Jezebel of the Old Testament didn't have any bad relationship, adulterous relationship, immoral relationship with all the men in the nation, all the men in the community apart from Ahab. But this one, this Jezebel, rotting her egg in a bag, in a in a basket of other eggs, she was committing fornication with others. And the Lord said, them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. In verse 23, it says, and I will kill her children with death, her followers with death, her companions with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he, which such as the race and hearts, and I will give unto everyone, not only Jezebel, I will give unto everyone, every backslider, every sinner, every compromiser, every corrupter, every leader that doesn't have any backbone, every member of the church that has been sucked in uh, into the pollution, defilement, corruption of that day and of this day. He says, I search the race and I search the hearts and I will give unto every one of you according 
to your works. Here we see, number one, the delinquency of a permissive pastor. In verse 20, the Lord spoke to this pastor. He said, you're delinquent. You're lacking in courage. You're lacking in conviction. You're lacking in strength. You are lacking in the number one duty you ought to carry out, the delinquency of a permissive pastor. We can say that about a parent, the delinquency of a permissive parent. A parent that will see any of the children going astray, bringing some partners into the house, and the mother will just look at that and turn the other way. The children of these days, if you talk now, I don't know what wicked thing she can do against me. A permissive parent, a permissive father, a permissive mother, the delinquency of a permissive parent, or maybe a pioneer, a pioneer that started a good ministry. And that ministry was based on the word of God. And it will run in those early days everywhere. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. After pioneering the work for a few years, now because of some little resistance and because of some little persecution and because of some little criticism, now, he cannot continue like that. He's saying, well, I don't want to die. Why not? Why don't you want to die? I don't want to, you know, waste my life. Why not? You waste your life. You waste everything you've got on the work the Lord has given you. I don't want to die. You want to die a compromiser? You want to die a fearful person? You want to die a corrupter. You want to die a permissive pioneer. You want to die a delinquent man, a delinquent woman. If, if there is something to die for, my brother, my sister, go ahead. Let death come. Death will usher you to glory. But this pastor, this preacher, this parent, this pioneer was delinquent. And that's why Jesus said, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest, you leave her alone. Thou permittest, you leave her alone. You allow that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. I'm sure you have heard that name before. Or maybe you are not familiar with that name now because nobody now names their daughter Jezebel. They know it's an evil name. What happened in the Old Testament? Jezebel came from a foreign land. In the foreign land she came from, she had been worshipping Baal. And there was no recognition, there was no mention of Baal in the land of Israel. But as she married Ahab, Ahab was the king of Israel at that time. And this strange woman, this bare woman, this idol worshiping woman came to the life of Ahab. And Ahab succumbed to the pressure of Jezebel. And now Baal worship corrupted the whole of the land. And the same thing was going to happen here in this church, moderate church in Tatira, that now this one that calleth herself a prophetess, but a corrupter, a prophetess, but a defiler, a prophetess, but an idol worshiper, a prophetess, but a fornicator, a prophetess, but an adulteress, brought this into the church of the living God, and she was forceful about it. And she was getting everyone she could contact into that defilement. That's why the Lord said, I have somewhat against you. But understand, this one just happens to be a woman, Jezebel. It could have been a man, Jeroboam. Jeroboam brought evil worship 
idol worship into the land of Israel. And even after he died, that thing continued. And then you will find this description about all those other kings. It will say, they ceased not, they stopped not to follow the way of Jeroboam. Look at this, who made Israel to see might not be a Jezebel, might not be a Jeroboam, might be an Aaron. You remember when Moses went to the top of the mountain to collect, to receive the law out of the hands of the Lord. Uh, Moses committed the church in the wilderness, the people of God, he committed them to the hands of Aaron. Before Moses came back from the mountain, Aaron had led the people to idol worship. And when Moses asked him when he came back, how oh, is it you have brought so great a sin upon the people? He said, let not your anger wax hot against me. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. What could I do? If I didn't allow them, you know the character of the people, and I couldn't stand their pressure. I couldn't stand the consequence of standing firm. A Jezebel, a Jeroboam, an Aaron, or might be an Eli. You remember Eli? In 1 Samuel chapter 3, the Lord sent little Samuel to him. And he said, what I am going to do, the ears of people in the land will tinkle. Their ears will make noise because I'm going to wipe out the house and the family of Eli from the priesthood. Why? Because he knew the sins that his sons were committing, how they were defiling women at the very gate of the temple. But he did nothing. He couldn't remove them. He couldn't chastise them. He couldn't discipline them. He was a permissive priest. And the Lord said, I have that against you. In fact, there are people that just let go and let everybody do whatever they want to do. And yet they remain in the position of leadership. The Lord is saying such people, he has something in against them. You know what's the right thing to do? Number one, it's good to repent. It's good to turn around and say, I will not be this way like a jellyfish that cannot stand. I will not be like this anymore. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, wash me. Lord, purge me. Lord, strengthen me. And give me a good backbone that can stand. On the other hand, you know what to do? If you're not willing to do that, to escape the great indignation and the great wrath that will come upon you on the final day if you are like Jezebel, like Jeroboam, like Aaron, like Eli. The best to do would be to withdraw yourself from the service of God. After all, your service is producing more people for hell than for heaven. And to say, I know I don't have the courage, I don't have the backbone, I don't have the strength, and instead of facing a sorrow punishment, a greater punishment on the final day, I will rather quit from the service so that I leave the service into the hands of those who still have the backbone and the strength and the vision and the forthrightness and the faithfulness to get the work done. Otherwise, a great judgment will come upon you. Let's look at the next thing there is the defilement from perverted prodigals. We're looking at Revelation chapter uh, 2, and I'm reading from verse 21. Revelation chapter 2, verse 21, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Remember this uh, woman? 
that called herself a prophetess, she had the same tendency and the same propensity and the same depravity as the Jezebel of the Old Testament. Instead of repenting, she'll rather have hatred against Elijah, the man of God. Instead of repenting, she'll rather send a threatening message to Elijah, the man of God, as you have dealt with those uh, prophets of Baal, if I'm Jezebel, if I'm the queen, if I'm the wife of the leader in this place, by tomorrow I will handle you like this. She did not repent. Look at the career of Jezebel. After introducing Baal worship, and then Elijah destroyed those uh, Baal pastors and Baal prophets in chapter 18 of First Kings. By chapter 19, chapter 20, and then as we come to Second Kings, Baal worship had come back again in full force and in full strength. Look at the career of Jezebel. By the time Jehu became a king in the land, he had to deal with Baal worship again. Not only that, as we look at that Jezebel of the Old Testament, after Elijah had destroyed all those Baal worshippers, all the Baal prophets, and then Ahab wanted the vineyard of Naboth. And the neighbor said, no, I cannot give my vineyard to another person. And then weak king, he was, uh, you know, blown up and he was angry. He was, uh, he had his bad temper and he was throwing tantrum. And then Jezebel said, what's the matter? What's happening to you? I told this uh, man, neighbor, to give me her vineyard, but she would not, he would not. And Jezebel said, don't worry about that. I'll get that for you. And she arranged, you see, after the rebuke and after the correction, you will think she will repent, but no, there was no repentance. And you know, she staged the death of Naboth and got that uh, vineyard for Ahab, the husband. You know, the Lord said concerning this Jezebel in the church in Tatira, I gave her space to repent, of her fornication, but she repented not. Anyone like that there, and because of that, you pastor, you become so permissive, you become like you don't have any spine, any backbone, and you're always looking down, and then you fear the people, you fear the women, you fear the men, you fear the young, you fear the old, you fear everyone except God. You don't have the fear of God, and you don't have the fear of the judgment day, and you allow the defilement to go on unchecked, uncontrolled, and the whole church that ought to be standing on holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That whole church that should be holy is now defiled and corrupt and evil. The Lord is saying judgment will come. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading from verses 16 and 17. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Don't you know, don't you understand that the believer is the temple of God? And if there is any Jezebel, if there's any Jeroboam, if there's any Aaron, if there's any Eli, if there's any Delilah, if there is any Solomon, if there is anyone that will defile that temple of God, God will have him destroyed. Don't you know that the church is the temple of God? Don't you know that the church is the body of Christ? And the body of Christ, the church of God, ought to be pure, ought to be holy, ought to be sinless, ought to be unblameable, ought to be sanctified. And if anyone is Jezebel, a Delilah, if anyone is Jeroboam and Aaron, if anyone is spineless pioneer, a spineless preacher, a spineless 
um, pastor will allow the destruction and the defilement of that church, him will God destroy it. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, it says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. The temple of God ought to remain holy. Itatira, the temple of God ought to remain holy. In Ephesus, in Smyrna, in Pagamos, the temple of God ought to remain holy. In Sardis, in Laodicea, in Philadelphia, the temple of God ought to remain holy. In Lagos, at the headquarters, and in your location there where you have the church, the temple of God ought to remain holy. It says, if any man, if any woman defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? What's that destruction about? When it says that man, that Jezebel, that Delilah, and that Aaron, and that Jeroboam, and that Eli will be destroyed. If he defiles the temple of God, what's that damnation about? Look at Matthew chapter 23, and we're reading from verse 33. Matthew chapter 23, we're looking at verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? The damnation is talking about the damnation of hell. In Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 4, Hebrews chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 4, marriage is honorable in all. Marriage is honorable in all. Stop there for a moment. You know, when we get married, that's honorable. But there are people, maybe you're a widow, and you're still of marriageable age, and you are born in inside, and you're not getting married. And if you're not careful, you might become a Jezebel in that local church. Because although marriage is honorable in all, you refuse to get married. And then you are luring many other people into a moral relationship with you. Marriage is honorable in all. Maybe you're a widow and you're still of marriageable age and the feeling is there in you. Instead of praying and getting married, you don't do that. You are trying to keep to the tradition, unspoken tradition of people around. And you want them to know that you know you're a man, uh, you love your wife who has uh, gone to be with the Lord in glory, and you're not thinking about any other woman, and your children are also encouraging you, Daddy, just stay like that. You ought to remain and keep your love for mommy who has gone. By the way, mommy has gone to heaven, and mommy has gone to be with the Lord. And mommy is enjoying her, what she has in heaven. And then you remain there projecting to the public that you are all right, but you are not all right. Marriage is honorable in all. If you become like a licentious person, adulterous person, a fornicating person in the church of the living God, and instead of getting married properly and normally, you become a, a defilement in the church. That's terrible. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Look at this, but all mongers and adulterers, God will judge. The people who are, you know, outwardly they appear clean, outwardly they appear all right, but in their heart, in their spirit, behind the closed door, and behind the curtain, and where people do not see, they are defiled, they are all mongers, they are fornicators, they are adulterers, they are like Jezebels in the church of the living God, adulterers and all mongers, 
God will judge. It tells us in Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, we're looking at verse 8. It says in verse 8, it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and all mongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's telling us all these things should not be in the church of the living God. Number one, any permissive pastor, permissive pioneer, permissive priest that will be delinquent and allow fear in the church, allow unbelief in the church, allow abomination in the church, allow murdering, ab abortion in the church, allow all mongers, defiled people, adulterers, adulteresses in the church, untouched, untouchable, allow sorcerers, witchcraft, familiar spirit in the church, allow idol worshippers, occultism in the church, allow lying, lying to the Holy Ghost like Ananias and Sapphira did, allow that in the church, such a permissive pastor, a permissive parent, a permissive pioneer will be dealt with by the Lord. And anyone that practices that directly himself. What was Jezebel thinking of? To be the perpetrator of defilement in the church of the living God. She was unbelieving. She didn't believe that the judgment of God will come. She would have seen. See, she was in the church, the judgment of God against the Jezebel of the Old Testament. But it's like, uh-uh, it will not happen to me. God forbid, that will happen to my enemy. That will not happen to me. Unbelieving. And there are people like that today, they keep on doing evil. They keep on living in sin. And they keep on living in polygamy. They keep on living with Many women, even though they don't bring them home, and they think judgment cannot happen to me. They are abominable. They are murderers. Or they are, when it says murderers, it's not like you carry a knife or you carry a gun to go and kill. And you see when people commit sin with a lady, and the lady becomes pregnant, they say, this must not be her. They must not know this. Whatever it will take, wherever they are going to do it, and they go to use those chemicals, and then they commit abortion, those are murderers. If you don't repent, all those things the Lord will judge. And then the sorcerer and the idolaters, the Lord will judge. And all liars without exception. It says they will have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. For the Lord is calling us to repentance, is calling us to righteousness, is calling us to restoration. He wants us to abandon all that. The Lord is coming. And because of the nearness of the Lord's coming, because of the imminence of the Lord's coming, he wants that repentance to be immediate and then for us now to hold on to the truth and hold on to that truth unto the very end. We'll come to point number three now. That is the promise for conquerors. The promise for conquerors. And you look at the promise that the Lord is giving here. Look at Revelation chapter 2 verse 24. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 24, But unto you I say, are you born again? Unto you I say, are you still standing in your salvation? And standing uncorrupted? 
and standing on the field and standing, not knowing and not getting into the defilement and into the depths of Satan like all the backsliders and corruptors have gone into. The Lord is calling those backsliders, come back home and them for those who are standing. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Tatira, as many as have not this doctrine, as many as have not this doctrine, as many as have not this doctrine. You know, my brother, there are people who want to be effective as a member of the prayer warriors. And the promises of God are plain that when you pray, He will answer you. You call on the name of the Lord, He will answer. But they want to find out the depths of Satan. They want to find out something, what the people are saying out there. And they go to buy some books and they go to get some information. How those other people that do not have total confidence in the blood of Christ, they don't have complete reliance upon the cross of Calvary, and they want to go and get what uh, the depths of Satan are. They want to know the secrets of demons, the names of demons, the activities of demons, and the power behind all those calls, and the power behind all those gangs, what gives them the boldness, what gives them the courage, what gives them the authority over all those things. They want to know the oppression of familiar spirits, oppression of witches and wizards, and they want to know all the powers of darkness, the deaths of Satan. Jesus said, I'm not giving you that to do. And if you say you are in the prayer warriors team, you pray, say you are praying for people, you say you want to have a crusade, you say you want to evangelize, and because of that you are delving into the deep things of Satan, that thing will rub you in, and that thing can put your soul into hellfire. He says, I say unto you, and unto the rest in Tatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put none other burden upon you. I will put upon you none other burden. Leave all that alone. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Don't go back into magic. Don't go back into occultism. Don't go back and be asking, how do those people cast out devils? How do those people do this or do that? It says, don't get involved with the depths of Satan. And you have preservation by being insulated, isolated from Satan. Look at verse 25. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 25 but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. It says that which you have already, hold fast till he comes. You have Christ, if you are born again, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in unto him, I will sup with him and he with me. You have Christ. If any man sub me, him will my father honor. And my father and I will come and make a abode in him. You have Christ and you have the father. And then he says, I will pray the father. And he will give you the comforter. That comforter that the world cannot receive. But you know him because he is with you and will dwell in you. You have the Holy Ghost and then you have the anointing and the unction that abides on you. Ye are God little children and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have the greater one abiding in you and you have the teaching of the word of God. All that the Lord has taught us from repentance to righteousness 
the resurrection, spiritual resurrection, regeneration, and rebirth. And then you have uh, all those doctrines of the Bible that which you have already. You have already freedom from sin. You have already forgiveness from sin. You have already the confidence and the faith in Christ. You have already the assurance that if you ask anything in my name, I will answer that which you have already. Hold fast till I come. You have holiness of heart, holiness of life, if you are sanctified, if you are purified, if you have consecrated yourself to the Lord, He has sanctified you. He that sanctifies and them who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. That holiness you have, that sanctification you have, that purity of heart you have, that which ye have already, hold fast until I come, the work he had given you to do. He wants you to hold that fast to you until he comes. Perseverance with integrity and steadfastness. You have integrity, you have steadfastness, and you're holding fast, and you'll keep on holding fast until he comes. Look at number three now. We're looking in a tribulation chapter 2, verse 26. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. My works unto the end. What does that mean? He that believeth on me. The works I do, my works, the works I do, he will do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. He keepeth my works unto the end. You see, there are people, they used to believe in the works of Christ. A Christ is a healer. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That's his work. And he went about talking to everyone, and the Lord says, you'll be my witnesses. That's his work. Preaching the gospel, and cleansing the lepers, and healing the sick, and delivering the oppressed, and casting out devils. That's the work he did when he was here. But you see, there are people that have abandoned that work now. They used to do that. They used to believe in that. It's like their Jesus has changed. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He that overcomes and keepeth my works unto the end. The Lord wants you to overcome all the doubts coming from the theologians. All the doubts, all the unbelief coming from the doubters and the unbelievers. The Lord wants you to abandon and to forsake all those things that unbelievers are saying. And you retain the faith of the Son of God and the work he did while he was here. You came to that work. You believe in that work. You affirm that work. And you are passionate about that work. And you keep those works unto the end. It says to him, will I give power over the nations. That's the power for being immovable in service. You are not moved. You continue in the work of the Lord, in the work of the master. And you continue to the very end. Look at verse 27. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 27, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I, even as I, even as I received of my father. He is the one that has that final authority that final supremacy, that final sovereignty. He is the one that the Father had promised 
that it will break the nations with a rod of iron. It will shatter them into pieces like vessels of a potter. He'll break them into shivers. But he now calls you that if you are an overcomer, you'll be a partaker with him in that unchallengeable influence, in that supreme sovereignty. And he says you'll be a partaker and you will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter and as uh, those uh, pots, you will break them into shivers as Christ has received of the Father. Look at verse 28. It says in verse 28, and I will give him, him, and I will give him. He identifies you and he singles you out. If you'll be an overcomer, if you will be a conqueror, he gives you the promise and he says, I will give him. You know, my brother, you know, my sister, when you were born into this world, you came all alone by yourself. And when you came into the kingdom, you came all alone by yourself. You didn't know Jezebel when you were born again. You didn't know Samson when you were born into the kingdom. You didn't know Delilah when you were born into the kingdom. You didn't know any compromiser. You didn't know any corrupter when you were born into the kingdom. You came as an individual. You know, you have to live your life as an individual. You know, you have to make, how you have to live your ministry, how you have to carry on your ministry as an individual. When you come to the judgment seat of Christ, You'll be there as an individual. And no Jezebel will come to say, Lord, leave me alone. I'm the one that influenced him. And there's no Samson, there's no Delilah, there's no Aaron that will come and say, Father, leave me alone, put everything on me. I'm the one that made him to be a compromiser. You stand alone before the Lord by yourself. And if you're going to be an overcomer, if you're going to be a conqueror, you will stand by yourself. You must have the backbone to stand all alone. I will give him the morning star. That means he'll give you the possession of illumination as a star. Now in verse 29, the peculiarity of instruction by the Spirit of God, he that has an ear, he that has an ear individual, he that has an ear a person, he that has an ear a minister, he that has an ear a member, he that has an ear a soldier of Christ, he that has an ear a person who lays everything on the altar again, who consecrates everything, who says whatever others do, I will stand he that has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. The Spirit says everything to everyone in the church. And now you must have the ear of an overcomer. The overcomers have a kind of ear. The ear that hears and they understand and they believe and they take it in and they personalize it and they go on their knees and they say, whatever courage I need, grant unto me the ear of an overcomer. The people that have an ear, the ear of an overcomer, the ear of a victor. They have that ear. You know, the victors are the, are the people that hear instruction and they say, this is the way walking therein and and they have the ear of a victor. They have the ear of an achiever. You know, an achiever has a different ear from all the other people. Those other people, the refraps and the people that are never do well, they have ears, but they don't hear. But the achiever, when he hears the instruction, when he hears the admonition, this is the way to be an achiever. He has the ear of an achiever. My brother, what kind of ear do you have? My sister there, what kind of ear do you have? Do you have the ear of an overcomer? Do you have the ear of a victor? Do you have the ear of an achiever? Do you have the ear of a saint of God? 
You have an ear, the ear of a rapturable member of the church. You have the ear of an obedient member of the church. You have the ear of a conquering shepherd in the kingdom of God. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I pray the Lord will give every one of us ears to hear and then we'll rise up and we'll take the word of God to heart, internalize, personalize the word of God, and the word of God will bear fruit in every one of our lives. The Lord wants to do all that it takes to make you a conqueror, to make you an overcomer, and to make you a victor, and to make you a person that will not be crushed or conquered or corrupted by any Jezebel anywhere. And so he wants us to rise up and pray. Why don't you rise up now? And then with the ear of a sage, the ear of a child of God, the ear of a person that wants to make it on the final day, the ear of a rapturable Christian, the ear of an overcomer. Why don't you tell the Lord and pray and say, Lord, here am I, Lord, have mercy on me. Here am I, Lord, have mercy on me. As he purified you, as he sanctified you, as he washed you, as he cleansed you, as he strengthened your backbone, as he gave me your courage, the Lord wants you to have the preserving power of the purified Christian, of the purified believer, of the purified member of the church. And brother, if you're a leader, brother, if you're a pastor, brother, if you're a minister, he wants you to have the courage of a purified, fortified minister. He wants you to be able to stand. And while you are praying, think about the local church that God has granted you the privilege to pastor. The people around you that God has given to make you influence them positively and lead them and guide them in the way to heaven. Think about them. Are they being corrupted? Are they being polluted? Are they being influenced by Jezebel? By Jeroboam? By an Eli? By an Aaron? By a Delilah? Are they being influenced by a Samson? Are they being influenced by Solomon? Are they being influenced by Ananias and Sapphira? Are they being influenced by people who do not have the interest of heaven at heart? Think about that. It's you, the Lord has committed the work to you. You're a minister, you're a pastor. The Lord wants you to have a goal, a purpose that is set from heaven. That you will, by the grace of God, lead people in the narrow path that leads to heaven. He wants you not to be a delinquent person, a delinquent pastor, a lacking preacher, a lacking shepherd, anemic, not having strength, not having power, not even having interest. And then you're using the COVID-19 lockdown as an excuse, I cannot reach the people. Are you sure? I cannot get to the people. Are you sure? Are you just using that to cover your weakness? And you're not contacting them. You're not preaching to them. You're not warning them. You're not reading the word of God to them. You're not expounding the word of God to them. The knees are weak. Your backbone is weak. Your heart is weak. You're like you don't have any strength. The Lord can give you strength today and he can inject the strength and the power and the fervency back into your life again. Any defilement in your own personal life? Any defilement in your family? Any Jezebel in your family? 
bringing defilement in your family. Since that marriage came in, since that house help came in, is your family as holy as you were before? Is your husband as clean as he was before? Is your wife as pure as she was before? Before that house hell, that mage came in. Think about that. The Lord wants you to examine everything and to evaluate everything and to stand clear before the Lord and not allow any defilement in your life, any defilement in your family, any defilement in your church, in your local church, because of the damnation that will come. But now, if you will isolate, isolate yourself from all the deaths of Satan, all the defilement of sinners, and you will insulate, isolate yourself and come out from among them and be ye clean and you are cleansed and you are washed and you are purged in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord still has a place for you among the conquerors, among the spiritual heroes, among the victors, among the people that will stand until Christ comes. And the Lord is saying, there's preservation for you as you isolate yourself, insulate yourself from the deaths of Satan. Don't check up about their idol worship. Don't check up about their idolatry. Don't check up about their occultism. Don't find out how they are doing their prayers, how they are raising up this and raising up that. He wants you to keep the spiritual distance from those uh, people and from those errors of the depths of Satan. He wants you to, to persevere with integrity. Persevere with integrity and with steadfastness. You are holding on to that which you have, the doctrines of the Word of God. The work the Lord has given to you, you are holding on until he comes. And you also have the power of being immovable, unshakable. Nobody can push you away from the work the Lord has given you to do because he wants you to hold that work until the end. He wants you to be a partaker of his influence right influence, positive influence upon others, that nobody will backslide through you, nobody will be defiled through you, but the influence of your life will be that everything that should not be in the kingdom, the rod is there in your mouth, in your hand to crush and to destroy and break them into shavers so that the people that know the Lord through you, or who have known the Lord before you came, that you will help in making them stand, standing firm and standing firmer than ever before. And the Lord wants you to possess that illumination like a star. The people that turn, the preachers that turn, the ministers that turn, others to righteousness, they will shine as stars forever and ever. And the Lord wants to, ta to have the right kind of ear. He that has an ear, have the right kind of ear. The ear of a learner, the ear of a leader, the ear of a conqueror, the ear of an overcomer, the ear of an achiever, the ear of a rapturable believer, the ear of a rapturable minister. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. May the Lord translate everything we've heard with our ears in our head, translate everything to our heart 
so that this message from Christ, the foundation of the flock, will bear fruit in every member of the flock in Jesus' name. Father, we bless your name for your goodness, for your love, and for the pungency of your word that you have sent into our hearts. We're asking, Lord, the grace, the enablement, the focus, the vision, the passion, the sincerity to take all this word, take everything to heart, and become better, a better Christian, a purer Christian, a holier child of God, a rapturable believer, that grace you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. And Lord, for all our pastors, all our ministers, all our leaders, men and women, we're asking that you so purify, you so purge, you so sanctify, you so make holy everyone that our influence on your church our influence on your members will be the influence of a purified preacher, purified pastor, purified pioneer, and will lead people deeper and deeper into your righteousness and holiness and into your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, we we'll pray for all the members that everything we've heard will lead us and draw us much nearer nearer, nearer unto Christ in Jesus' name. Lord, cleanse everyone and give us the mind and give us the heart and give us the fervency and give us the focus and give us the backbone and give us the courage of a person who wants to endure in the doctrines of holiness until the very end. Strengthen your people, Lord, and make us the strong immovable, steadfast believers, righteous people we ought to be for your goodness, for your grace, for your kingdom, and for the progress of the whole church in Jesus' name. We well, thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.